At the heart of the push for the Synod is a concept called sustainable development. When we break the concept down into its two parts, we get something typically progressives care about, sustainability, and then development. To understand this concept, we can first understand development to, the be, to the, be the building of infrastructure, usually thought of as roads and bridges and electrical systems, but really encompassing the building of all aspects of the, moder of the modern so-called developed world. Sustainability is a more complicated idea, but it is one that runs right through the heart of the most of the work of this pontificate, and especially the Amazon Synod's Instrumentum Laboris. Sustainability is a materialistic, atheistic concept that adopts much of the worldview of the secular social justice movement, tempers it slightly, and applies the logic to typically three focus points – social sustainability, economic sustainability, and environmental sustainability. Proponents of sustainability make the charge that the trappings of modern civilization are unsustainable. That is, they cannot be carried on into the future indefinitely because not only do they violate the rights and norms of justice that we would apply to other people, both our neighbors and to people living across the globe, but that the environment cannot take modern civilization for much longer before some kind of catastrophe occurs. It is this concept we'll look at today, and it's one that I've spent a lot of time studying. It's the subject of sorts of my doctoral dissertation, but that work is focused on finding a Catholic alternative using Catholic social teaching. At the start, long ago, I was a believer in some of the claims of those who do that work, but have since come into near opposition to it by virtue of having read a lot of papal encyclicals and the scientific research associated with the environmental claims that go into it. But we're going to look briefly at the concept of sustainable development and sustainability, and how we can see the logic behind it in the Amazon Synod. And then I'll tell you why I think it's largely not only nonsensical, but a dangerous idea. But first, let's define our concept. And to that, we will use something from my doctoral dissertation proposal. I wrote this several years ago when I actually bought into much of this. Let that be a bit of a disclaimer. Conceptually, sustainabil sustainability is rooted in the early politics of conservation and preservation in the United States and in Germany. Early, the figures concerned with the state of the environment and man's relationship to nature could be divided largely into two camps, the managerial and the spiritual. The managerial camp would find the greatest expression of the assumed values in the work of the German, British, Indian, and United States forest services, and will place a heavy emphasis on administration of forests as, a, as resources for indefinite future use by generations far into the future. The spiritual movement itself would arise as a backlash against the managerial ethics of the various agencies tasked with preserving natural resources for future use. The spiritual opposition sought value in nature itself, that is, nature qua nature, not for a utility to humans, but due to a perceived intrinsic value to nature itself. For this, I, from this idea would spring the various ecology movements, including social ecology, which sought to illustrate the links between mankind and nature. Some proponents of social ecology were particularly influential in the development of analysis of geography, environments, and human communities in a way that made clear the deep connections human beings have with the natural environment. The managerial and spiritual camps represent a sort of synthesis in the sustainable development literature of today to a large degree. Though the spirituality is toned down, to adherents of this approach to international development efforts, most would say that the managerial approach has won the debate. Though the appearance of Pope Francis in the hierarchy of much of the church in the Western world into the debate has shifted things considerably into the favor of the spiritual side of the debate. At its core, the spiritual proponents of sustainability believe that current religious systems, specifically Christianity, are not only up to the task of creating a more sustainable world, that they are in large part responsible for environmental situation and the structures of inequality and oppression that dominate the world today. That ultimately, that religion will be replaced with something more in keeping with the needs of the earth and the demands of justice. Now, as an aside, that's an erroneous idea, obviously, for numerous reasons, but including the fact that many early proponents of what would later get called sustainability were Christian activists themselves, of, albeit of various denominations, who sought to promote the values of stewardship from a point viewpoint of religious duty. But what is sustainability? It comes from the idea that the structures of the world, be they political, economic, social, or anything else, cannot be carried on into the future because they are either unjust, or at the very least result in catastrophic damage to the environment, including climate change, depleting wildlife numbers in the oceans, rising acid levels in the oceans, and numerous other measures of the health of, planet, of the planetary biosphere.
The traditional means of measuring this is through the concept of the seventh generation principle, and I'll quote the work of, in, of an indigenous advocacy group for a clearer definition. Quote, the seventh generation principle is based on an ancient Iroquois philosophy that the decisions we make today should result in a sustainable world seven generations into the future. This, is, this extremely prescient philosophy is currently somewhat overused as a green marketing ploy to sell everything from dish soap to cars. The seventh generation principle today is generally referred to in regards to decisions being made about our energy, water, and natural resources, and ensuring those decisions are sustainable for seven generations into the future. But it can also be applied to relationships. Every decision should result in sustainable relationships seven generations in the future. End quote. Now, it should be clear after suffering through that excerpt from my dissertation proposal that sustainable development is the work of governments and non-governmental organizations, or NGOs. Now, I don't think all NGOs are bad, per se, but many, many of them are locked up in the work of population control, and that idea is one that runs in the heart of sustainability, and it's one that rather obviously runs counter to the Catholic faith. But I really want to zero in on something here, and that's the so-called seventh generation principle. I used an example from an indigenous business advocacy group on purpose for this video, because to be clear, the Amazon Synod document is focused almost exclusively on the needs of the indigenous peoples of South America and beyond, seeing them as a font of wisdom about how to live in harmony with the created world. That source I quoted above uses a common misconception that Brent Ben Franklin was allegedly greatly influenced by the Iroquois tribes in his proposals for developing the American Constitution, when in reality he was influenced largely by Greece and Rome, though he was impressed that many of the principles from those civilizations had been mirrored by the tribes of the Iroquois. But the logic is there. This seeing the indigenous peoples as a leadership model for promoting how we are to live in accordance with the environment. And this is the key. The seventh generation principle says essentially that decisions made today cannot adversely affect those people living seven generations from now. To give you an idea of what that means, imagine Americans living seven generations ago. According to most of the scholarship on sustainable development, that would mean looking at peoples born between the years 1692 and 1742, which seems like a broad swath of history, but to be sure, Americans living in that time period would have called themselves English subjects, not Americans. Now imagine economic and environmental decisions being made at that time with the needs of people living in the early 21st century United States in mind, and you begin to see the absurdity of this concept in practice. People will say that I'm taking the idea too literally, and that de decisions should be made that don't adversely affect the needs of those living far into the future. Logically, this concept has problems, including that we don't know what future generations will need aside from the most basic needs like food, water, shelter, electricity, etc. Yet another problem should be made clear when I remind you of this. that The core pillars of sustainability are social sustainability, economic sustainability, and environmental sustainability. Now, if decisions are made in these three areas in keeping with that seventh generation principle, what's the result? Well, you get a system where, due to the managerial nature of the sustainable development work, the major decisions of economics and social policy are determined based on the perceived needs of people who will live in a, about 250 to 300 years from now. This is, to put it most bluntly, a way of advocating for a centrally planned economy, aka socialism, at the very least, if not worse. Now, the proponents of sustainable development, especially those who have adopted both the managerial and spiritual approaches into one terrifying synthesis, will say that socialism isn't necessarily how this will be accomplished because we can use the mechanisms of education to train young people into seeing these concerns, internalizing them and adopting the values for finding solutions to structural inequity and environmental concerns. In other words, we can use the state to indoctrinate people into buying into what can only really be described as a paganized system for authoritarian control based on crappy science. Sounds like fun, right? If you don't think this is going on already, I'm going to point you to the activism of a certain 16-year-old Swedish girl who has somehow been given a global microphone and stage, and she uses it to tour the U.S. and the various nations of the West, including to speak to the United Nations, who are one of the principal proponents of sustainable development, and where she then proceeds to lecture people about how her future has been stolen from her due to the bad science of environmentalism that has convinced her that a catastrophe just looms around the corner of the next decade. A claim for which, by the way, has been promoted by the various environmental sustainability NGOs and politicians since the 1960s, and that we are facing some sort of global catastrophe that is always just a decade away or so, and that we must enact draconian principles and policies to prevent that catastrophe from happening.
The example of that young woman is instructive because it shows how widespread this thinking has come, and how it has been implemented by the education system of the Western world to great effect already. Now, on the surface, I'll say this, that sustainable development doesn't sound like a terribly bad idea when taken at its most basic, basic level. Who is against building infrastructure and political systems for the developing world that will continue to serve the needs of those living many years from now, that will not poison their drinking water and fishing water supplies? That will protect natural systems in developing countries. You know, most people really aren't against those things, depending on how you go about doing it. But what is often overlooked is the role that the NGOs play in all of this. And that is critical to understanding the link of this concept to the Amazon Synod. Remember, the chief proponents and architects of the Instrumentum Laboris were two German NGOs that do development work in the Amazon, and both have German bishops that sit on their boards of directors. The involvement of the Catholic Church in this work is nothing new, either. It didn't start with Pope Francis. As far as I can tell, the first pope to adopt the concerns of the environmental movement and who sought to promote a saner way of developing the land was Pope Paul VI, who included some concerns for environmental degradation in his encyclical Populorum Progressio, which was written back in the days of Rachel Carson warning people about the use of dangerous chemicals like DDT and others that can be shown to have a detrimental effect on the lives of humans and animals and the environment more broadly. This concern was carried forward, and it evolved, as ideas typically do, by John Paul II, and especially by Benedict XVI. And it was Benedict who was first labeled the Green Pope for his various speeches on environmental concerns. I even have a book of quotes of his speeches on the environment that is published by Our Sunday Visitor. Here's one quote to give you an idea. Quote, With Jesus Christ, Abraham's blessing was extended to all peoples, to the universal church as the new Israel, which welcomes within her the whole of humanity. Yet what the prophet said is also true today in many senses. Thick darkness covers the peoples and our history. Indeed, it cannot be said that globalization is synonymous with world order. It is quite the opposite. Conflicts for economic supremacy and hoarding of resources of energy, water, and raw materials hinder the work of all who are striving at every level to build a just and supportive world. There is a need for greater hope, which will make it possible to prefer the common good of all to the luxury of the few and the poverty of the many. This great hope can only be God, not any God, but the God who has a human face, the God who showed himself in the child of Bethlehem and the crucified and risen one. End quote. Now, we can see that Benedict, that with Benedict, the Catholic Church fully entered into the spiritual versus managerial debate about sustainability. And it should be clear that this passage from one of his public addresses can be seen as evidence for a continuity between Benedict and Francis, <laughs> though to Benedict's credit, he did attempt to at least find a Christian solution to this problem. And I maintain that today the professed concerns of the sustainable development advocates and organizations can only be found in adoption of the values of the Catholic social teaching tradition as the means of dealing with the issue of development, and that, to make that work, the gospel must be spread throughout the world. But that is all ver a very far cry from the Am what the Amazon Synod is proposing, which goes back to ecumenism. The ecumenism of the Synod can be understood as this. Recall that the purpose of ecumenism, according to, the Va to Vatican II thinking, is to foster a mutual understanding of our differences, that the values we hold can lead to a better understanding of God and to peace and all of that. Which, with a sort of underlying assumption that we as Catholics m have much to learn from pagan and non-Catholic religions. We see this in the Amazon Synod working document, with its call for a church with an Amazonian face. Which, when you understand that the people of the Amazon largely follow pagan tribal religions with literally evil practices, means that what we're talking about is the adoption of pagan thinking, at least in the work in that region, but in reality, it was spread to other parts of the globe. To this end, the, Amazon, to the Synod documents call for the Catholic priests to be trained in the performance of pagan rituals and given permission by their bishops, again, mostly in the Amazon, but it will spread, given permission by their bishops to provide these rituals for the pagan peoples of the Amazon along with the sacraments. That's merely the tip of the iceberg, too, when we understand what we're dealing with here. So what does this all mean? Understand that this has been the focus of the church since practically the start of the Francis pontificate. From the beginning, he was giving talks on the issue of the environment. We know for a fact now that the synod went to early planning mere months after his election, and that the work of La for Laudato Si began shortly thereafter. Laudato Si, interestingly enough, was heavily influenced by similar NGOs, with some of it thought to have been ghostwritten by the likes of Jeffrey Sachs and others who engage in much of the development work in the so-called developing world today. It's also worth noting that these same NGOs are at the forefront of promoting organized Moloch worship and the contraceptive mentality in the developing world, 
based on another form of bad and discredited science called the population bomb, which in short suggests that we're headed towards a massive population disaster, where the world is overpopulated and starvation from food scarcity ensues on a grand scale. These same groups have been promoting this fundamentally anti-Catholic idea for decades, despite it being demonstrated to be nonsense long, long ago. But that's a subject for another time. In the end, I think the takeaway should be this. The solutions to a perceived environmental crisis as understood by the sustainability people that have shown up in the various documents on this issue in the church would require more globalization, more international integration, more surrender of sovereignty, all best on shoddy science, all the while using pagan peoples as a smokescreen. I don't for a second believe that the German bishops and the NGOs care one bit about the beliefs of the indigenous peoples of the Amazon. But I do believe that they'd be willing to use them to promote their agenda of modernism on the church. And I do believe that the NGOs they're working with would happily exploit those people for money in the building of their project towards increased authoritarian control on the lives of the people around the world. That's my takeaway, and I'll probably get called a nut for saying that and for saying this, but so be it. So what do you think of all this? I could go deeper into the concept of sustainability if people want that in the future. At the core of it is the concept of social justice, which is a concept the Catholic Church invented. You first saw it referenced by Leo XIII and by Pius IX, and then was summarily distorted and inverted by the secular world, which is typical. Despite what some people will say today, social justice does exist and it is a Catholic concept, but it's not what the secular forces who supposedly champion the concept would have you believe. Anyway, let me know what you think of this sustainable development concept and its application to the Synod, and by the Church in the comments, please. This stuff is heavy and hard to deal with, but in the end, it is the result of the non-governmental organizations taking advantage of a church desperately trying to embrace the world in the spirit of Vatican II. Thank you for listening. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.